Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's podcast. At this time, all lines have been placed on listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for your questions and comments following the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question during the webcast, you may do so by clicking on the Ask a Question button located below the presentation. Simply type your question into that box and hit Submit. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Martha Kitty Lidu. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm Martha Kitty Lidu, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth of six webcasts on our LibValue IMLS grant. Today's webcast is on the success of the teaching and learning processes. And uh, before we start, uh, just uh, a couple of uh, logistical things. First of all, thank you for joining us. Everyone will be muted to cut down on background noise. We do welcome questions. Please type your questions and ARL staff stand ready to answer all of them. Uh, we will also use some of them to interact with our speakers. Questions and answers that we do not address as well as the ones we do address during the webcast will be distributed to attendees after the webcast along with the recording. Uh, which will be available on the ARL YouTube channel. So uh, today, here with us, we have uh, two uh, very uh, involved and uh, well-known uh, speakers. Carol Tenopier, the Lead Value Lead Principal Investigator and Professor at the School of Information Sciences. Uh, Carol is also director of the Center for Information and Communication Studies at the University of Tennessee. She's been the leading force of pulling together this amazing uh, research team and um, uh, led the lesson, a lot of the lessons and testing and piloting we've done over the last three years. And also from the University of Tennessee, we have Rachel Fleming May, Assistant Professor at the School of Information Science is there. So what are we going to try to cover today with you? Uh, we do want you to be uh, familiar with the broad scope of the Lib Value Project, so I'll cover a couple of slides with that introduction. We do want you to understand various types of value of scholarly collections to faculty. And uh, also, we try to differentiate through um, the study Carol will be reporting uh, the value of books and journals in the research and teaching processes. And we also want to learn about findings from the instructor survey uh, that we did at two institutions. So, Lib Value. And we have tried to capture a lot of the work we've done in a number of webcasts. This is the fifth one. There is one more coming uh, down the road. And um, all the previous ones are already available on YouTube. And this one will be there. So the Lib Value uh, work includes multiple institutions that are using multiple methods to measure multiple types of value to multiple stakeholders. And uh, it's a pretty complex um, set of studies. Uh, we do focus on the teaching and learning, on the research aspects, and the social and professional outcomes. And all of that in the context of academic institutions. So the university mission and goals and how the library and these processes feed in promoting the mission and goals is paramount. The grant in, has been funded by IMLS, and uh, it involves uh, two institutions that have uh, principal investigators, Carol Tenopier from the University of Tennessee and Paula Kaufman from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. ARL is a key partner in uh, especially dissemination and communication of the findings, but also in ensuring that after the grant is over, we will take the lessons learned and the um, valuable uh, elements that are sustainable uh, beyond the duration of the grant. We also have Syracuse as a partner institution uh, in this process. Uh, Bruce Kinma from there has been involved in the grant, and through uh, connections Carol has in the UK, we've had um, 
relationships with the GISC collections. Now, in, within ARL, this work builds into the history of what we have done over the last decade in trying to develop new tools and measures, uh, those we have tried to um, uh, push them out through a gateway um, that's really a web interface um, for library assessment tools that describe the role, character, and impact of both physical and digital libraries. The gateway we've branded as StatsQuo, and uh, that gateway houses not only the traditional ARL statistics, a data collection that started back in predates all of us. It started back in 1908 at the University of Minnesota with Gerald, who was the dean of libraries at that time. Uh, it also houses the, and actually in some ways the genesis of, of this whole platform is LibQual, uh, standardized user survey that measures uh, library service quality in terms of the effect of service, how employees treat customers, information control in terms of access and uh, to resources, uh, and um, library as place. Uh, we know these three um, elements are key components of library service quality now, and we've been able to test it and implement it and uh, operationalize it in more than 1,300 libraries across the globe. We also have an internal climate survey as part of the StatsCall platform, a staffing survey that uh, looks into organizational climate and diversity. And we have experimented with um, other grants. DigiCall was an NSF-funded effort uh, to develop um, uh, the elements of digital library service quality. And the Minds for, li for Libraries is an approach to measure um, the impact of networked electronic services. And this also is an operational uh, tool that continues um, to this day. Now, before we move on with our speakers, we have a little poll for you. And um, Amy will help me with that poll. Okay, uh, yes, the first poll question asks uh, whether your library has an e-format preferred collection policy. And you should see a box pop up on your screen where you can answer. Uh, the choices are yes for journals, yes for books, yes for both journals and books, no but we're considering it, or no plans at this time. We'll wait a few moments for answers to come in. Like we've gotten a good response so far. I'm going to stop the question. And previewing the results, um, so far, uh, the majority, 41%, have an e-preferred po policy for journals, um, only 6% for books, 41% for both, and 6% um, have um, uh, are considering it, and 3% have no plans at this time. Clearly, the e-book um, strategy, the e-journal strategy, the e-format strategy is the major one. And uh, um, the large portion of the collections budgets are going on purchasing electronic resources. Uh, so uh, this uh, is no surprise anymore. So Carol will tell us a little bit, Carol Tenopier will tell us a little bit more about how some of these uh, format changes and different formats relate to the value of scholarly reading. Carol? Hey, thank you, Martha. And I, I want to join Martha in, in welcoming you. I'm pleased that you could make it today. And uh, also, in advance, a welcome to others who may be joining us uh, for the replay. Martha mentioned that LibValue has been an ongoing, continuing joint effort. And um, with, it has been possible because of the help of many academic librarians all over the world. So we've had lots in North America, as well as the UK and, and also Australia looking at um, testing um, many different ways to measure value and, and giving us a chance to come up with methods that 
that have been uh, validated and verified in a variety of institutions so that eventually we'll have um, all the information about uh, how you might want to uh, to use these different methods in, in your particular library. And um, Martha also mentioned that I'm uh, lead principal investigator, uh, principal investigator along with Paula Kaufman at University of Illinois. But my role today is actually as lead of one of our teams because the way LibValue works is we work in subject themes since it's such a big project and so many, uh, the library is so complex, we had to break things down into teams. So I'm the lead of the uh, scholarly collections team so that what I'm going to be telling you about today are some of the results from the scholarly uh, collection team. The, um, uh, some of you may be familiar with the work I've done for a long time, with, along with Don King, looking at reading and scholarship surveys. And the work in LibValue builds and, uh, on that and kind of goes beyond some of what we've done. Because we've been looking at value of um, articles and journal reading for a long time, we can begin to look at changes over time. The, uh, the poll results are interesting to me because a lot of the decisions that libraries ma make are helping drive changes in readership and user behavior. Sometimes the, the desires and the, and the behavior changes, uh, make changes in the library policies. It's very much a, a circular kind of thing that builds on it. But libraries do indeed um, make a difference in terms of behavior and, and, uh, and value also to your users. So um, I'll talk a little bit about um, how this current project fits into the past. But mostly what I want to look focus in is the purpose, outcome, and value from scholarly reading of, of journals and books. Uh, we, we have data on differences based on subject discipline, age of reader status. I'm not going to go into a lot of that today, but I do want to let you know that on the LibValue Project website, within the next month or so, combined reports for Australia and the U.S. will be made available for faculty members and uh, students. Um, each of the institutions that's been involved uh, in the three countries now have their individual reports, and we've um, made uh, combined reports that will be made available. The UK report is available um, from GIST Collections, and all of the others will be. Uh, because we started looking at readings a long time ago, it became clear that one of the major changes over time has been that the library has had an increasing role in uh, where people access uh, articles and so that for this project that made us see what if we focus in just or really look at the at the library what value uh, what role is the library having in terms of providing content so that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today now every person reads for lots of different reasons and every reading doesn't have the same value so we cannot just do surveys or interviews with individuals to find out how often they use the library or what kind of value they get from the materials because some readings are really valuable and some readings waste their time. So we want to get a big picture of the readings and the complex kind of behavior that every um, academic staff faculty member has. So to do that, um, we have used a variation on the critical incident technique um, for a long time. And again, I suspect some of you have heard me talk about this. But it's important to look at the difference between reading so as a faculty member when I read for research versus when I read for personal awareness. How does that differ in terms of value? So we start um, we ask people in our surveys to focus in on the last article they read, for example, in our article section. The idea that we're getting a sample of readings, some readings valuable, some not, in addition to a sample of individuals. Uh, besides the scholarly articles in LibValue, we've expanded our work, and we also ask them to look at book reading. So um, same kind of questions. We have a section on articles and a section on books. And um, we also have a section on other kinds of scholarly materials, the other publication read most recently. So this could be something, um, most often this was um, a report or an article from a magazine or a conference paper, but it could also just be a, a website or whatever. We've, we ask them what they are, but any, any kind of scholarly material. So this gives us a broader picture of 
where the library fits in on different kinds of readings and where they're getting things from places other than the library, which is kind of important, not just to focus on what the library does, but to also focus on the, if you will, the competition or the other places where people can go to get the scholarly information they need. And in the future, this may become even more important to look at where the library fits in um, along with other things. So um, I took all the data, as I said, there's going to be full reports, 100-page reports, many, many reports uh, coming out. But um, I've decided to just focus in on what I think are five conclusions that speak on the topic of, of uh, value to research and teaching. So the first conclusion uh, that I'm going to share with you is that academics read a lot. Uh, we know they read a lot from downloads and, and, uh, and log data. And then uh, it certainly is um, true when we, when we look at questionnaire data to ask them how much they read. And this has been true for a long time. So when we take all subject disciplines, all, um, all types of material across all faculty, on average faculty report that they read about 21 articles a month. That doesn't mean they read the whole thing. We define reading as going beyond the title and abstract into the body of the article or for book going beyond the, the table of contents and title into the body of a chapter or, or the, a book. So this is reading from articles, if you will, or reading parts of articles or whole, reading from books or book chapters and, um, and other publications. You add this all together, if you take this time 10 months or times 12 months, depending on whether you give people a break. Uh, faculty members read a lot in the summer, so usually we do this times 12. That is a lot of interaction with scholarly information. We also ask them about how much time they spend uh, reading, and so one measure of value is the time spent interacting with this material. They read a lot. It is a value to them. They spend their valuable time. They spend a lot of time reading. That's a measure of exchange value. They're willing to spend their time on reading. And um, this has not gone down um, over 30 years. It has been pretty steadily going up. It's leveling off now, maybe down a little bit, only so many hours in the day. But um, the, the amount of reading continues to be a huge uh, part of a faculty member's time. The, um, um, I mentioned that readings do differ by discipline and, again, have a lot more details on this, but just to show you a little bit um, that the value to different subject discipline faculty members and students is going to be different for different parts of the collection. Medical sciences faculty members rely very much on journals and articles, and that is, is of huge value to them. They read a lot of articles. Those are, those are in terms of exchange value, um, come up very high. Not surprisingly, faculty members in humanities read a lot more from books or book chapters. And so the, it, the amounts vary, so we have to be a little bit careful about um, when we look at value to look at the values of collections based on subject disciplines. The, um, um, we're not going to talk about students today, but I did just want to give you one slide that has some student data on articles and books, um, and just to refer you to those uh, graduate students and undergraduate students' um, uh, reports that will be coming out soon. So um, the group that reads the most in terms of articles are, no surprise, graduate students at their time they're writing their thesis or dissertation. They report reading lots and lots of articles. Uh, the, the collection development um, problem here, if you will, or challenge, I guess I should say, is that that reading is very narrow and very deep. And uh, once they move on from your university, they may not be, uh, people may not be reading in that same uh, subject discipline. So they read a lot. So when you're looking at value of total collections, of course, you need to take into account uh, the readings. And of course, there are more undergraduate students and graduate students than faculty. So if you want to measure total volume of reading um, of print and electronic, they're both here, and this is, includes readings from the library and not, you need to um, take this monthly averages times a year and then times the total number of um, graduate students, undergraduate students, and faculty. And then you can get a measure of total time spent or total interaction. The um, 
The next point I want to move on to is that scholarly readings are essential to academic work. Actually, they have been essential. They remain so and perhaps are rated as even more highly than they were um, in the past. Uh, when we ask about the principal purpose of the last article reading, that random sample of readings by the faculty members, we find that reading for research or writing is the big bulk of reading of articles. Uh, reading for teaching is the next big chunk. If you put research and, and writing and teaching together, that uh, is a fair um, amount of the reading, a big percent of the reading by faculty. However, faculty read for lots of reasons, including current awareness, continuing education, just because they're interested, uh, curiosity, all those things fall into the other. So um, you have to make a distinction um, in between the um, purpose of reading and the amount of reading. If we look at um, where readings come from, we find that the readings for research um, and writing and um, readings for teaching are read on average longer than readings for other purposes, are ranked more highly valuable to the purpose, and are most likely to come from the library. The readings for current awareness and other purposes most often do not come from the library. Those readings, which are ranked as not as valuable to purpose, and people spend less time, those more, most often come from personal subscriptions, or from um, just from the open web. But the readings um, for research or writing and uh, teaching most often come from the library. Readings for research and um, writing also are reported to be read with greater care. Uh, one of the conclusions I have from this is that the library really does support the research teaching mission of the university because that's where the, the focus is in terms of um, uh, readings that come from the library. Uh, that leads to the, uh, to the third point, and a point that both Martha and I made after the poll, in that libraries are making a difference in reading patterns. We've seen huge changes in, in reading patterns, in, both in amount of reading and where people get materials, and a lot of it has to do with the e-library, e-journal collections in the libraries. In fact, the single uh, most reason for an increase in amount of reading from 77 to 2012 is that people are getting e-collections from the library. That's the one source that's grown the most. So if I look at some of the data, we, we asked where did you obtain the article. I decided to compare, uh, to show you some of the changes just by looking at surveys done in 2005 in the U.S. and just the U.S. surveys of, of faculty done in 2012 that we've just finished analyzing. Not much change in that time from library reading. Um, if you looked at, if I showed you 77 to 2012, you'd seen a huge change in library reading. Library readings are holding pretty steady. Um, the big changes have been drop in personal subscriptions. So personal subscriptions continue to go down and down. Personal subscriptions that are still there, readings from them are more likely to be in paper. Um, readings from the library uh, much less likely. So library readings holding pretty steady. Now the other increase is readings from the web. We know, you know, that some of those readings from the web really come from the library. As link resolvers get better and better, readings, uh, readers are less likely to know when their e-readings come from the library. So libraries need to do a better job of sending that message. We know that the library readings is actually an underestimate because people aren't always aware. Carol, I don't see the slides moving on my end, actually. I was wondering. If um, I should be on slide 26. Okay. Rachel, are they moving on your end? I, yeah, they're moving on my end. Okay. It must be something in my computer. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, hope, I hope people are seeing slide 26 here. <laughs> um, just because people read from the library collections, remember 56 approximately percent of readings come from the library, of course, doesn't mean they're reading in the library. So when we measure value, we have to be really careful when you're talking about faculty support of research and teaching not to tie it to the physical library. The, view, the um, visits to the virtual library have increased steadily among faculty members, even if they're not increasing their visits to the, to the at 
least for collections, to the physical library. So only 2% of the readings from the library are actually read in the library. Um, Libraries are enabling uh, more productivity because they're allowing uh, e-collections, allow faculty to read from their office lab or from home. The, um, because, just because a reading is in E doesn't mean that reading um, is, is necessarily um, a final form of reading is in print, uh, is in E. When we asked about what source it is, we know now that 79% of the readings come from an E source. So vast majority come from a source. That print, as I mentioned, in 2012 is mostly personal collections. Some of the readings from the library are print, but mostly personal collections. When I compare that to final form or format of last reading, however, um, we find that a, a fair amount is still printed out on paper. So just a small sliver, just a a quarter, less than a quarter, 20-something percent of readings um, come from print resources, but still a lot of print, printing going on. Um, what's interesting, if you compare from 2005 to 2012, though, you'll see that there's a lot more reading going on on screen. So we asked for the first time in 2012, we asked, what kind of screen are you reading on? Still, it's laptop or desktop mostly. It's only about 2 to 4% of the readings that are done on a mobile device. Surely that's going to be going up and something that, that publishers and libraries need to be thinking about. A lot more on-screen reading than there has been. Screens have gotten better for one thing, but also formats have gotten better. I don't want to spend too much time on, um, on um, comments, but I, I do want to make the point that open-ended comments or interviews or focus groups are another way to measure value. Uh, we don't want to rely just on data, uh, just on averages, just as on percents, because a library needs to have value to the outliers as well as the average user. And so um, interviews, open-ended comments are a way to get those outliers to get also um, comments on that are representative as uh, of the whole or of the averages, and also to give a personal face to the data. So when you're talking about measuring value, don't forget the personal. Don't forget the comments, the, um, the, the, um, the individual kind of value, the stories. The, all of those kinds of things are another important way to measure value. If I did a, a, a if I looked at the words that came up most often, we'd find that things like essential come up a lot or um, important. Those kinds of words um, are, are, are uh, things that academic staff say a lot. It's important when you do open-ended comments for evaluation not to ignore the, um, the negative comments or the comments that might make suggestions for ways to be changed as well. So evaluation, measures of value are not only about um, getting people to tell you how wonderful that you know you are. They're also about ways to improve or set priorities. And so in comments, it gives people a way to focus on uh, ways that they, they don't want things to change or ways that, uh, that things could be improved as well. So we've, we've pulled some comments here about, uh, um, about things that, that may um, speak to the way um, things shouldn't change, but also the way things might be changing in the future. So one person, more than one person said, I find myself looking at blogs more or I'm beginning to change my behavior. And these are ways to help continue this, um, not only measurement of value, but continuing uh, providing value into the future. The fourth point uh, that I want to make is that book readings are definitely different from article readings. Um, libraries have, have um, made a huge investment in e-journals, and of course many of you have e-preferred for journal collections and have just begun to do that for book collections. The library uh, value and use of uh, journal collections has, can certainly be demonstrated now and has changed behavior. Books, it's really early days. If we look at all the book readings, it's still a fairly small percent that come from library collections. This includes e and print. So um, whereas over half of article readings come from libraries, um, only 28% in the U.S. of book readings currently come from, come from library collections. The most common place for book readings are I pull it off my shelf, the publisher sends it to me, or I buy it. 
So purchasing is still a uh, method. Individual purchases are still a, a way that books books get purchased or something from a from a um, publisher. And um, I think this is important because this is where we were with articles 20 years ago. People bought personal subscriptions, journals. That's where the bulk of readings came from. So I think that you're going to see where libraries are beginning or will begin to change this book reading. You're at the beginning stages. We'll see what happens with um, with ebook collections. Convenience is the key, and uh, pulling it off my shelf right now is the most convenient way for book reading. Ebooks may become more convenient. This is a really complex. Um, slide and I left it in here because I wanted to show one comparison with Australia. The yellow or the gold is Australia, the red is the U.S. Um, and if you look at the second set of bars over, that's library readings of books. This is percent. And you'll see that in the U.S. ones we looked at, these, these universities, Syracuse, Illinois, Tennessee, Seton Hall and Colorado, they all have good e-book collections, but the percent of book readings from e in the library is still really small. Only about 4% of total book readings from the library came from e in the U.S. universities. In the Australian universities, which already have an e-preferred collection development policy for e-books, and not so easy books or paper books are expensive there. Um, 19% of the book readings come from, from E. So we're beginning to see some changes. Um, and I would think that changes as more universities get uh, more e-book collections and as the platforms get more consistent and the, the licensing gets better, we may see a change. If you go down to the far uh, set of bars, you'll see readings from other sources of books, mostly from, from the open web. It's about half and half between um, e in print, so it's not that the um, that the faculty members are are not um, not reading e. You put that together with more reading on screen, you can see that there will probably be some additional um, changes in behavior and value. I need to uh, yeah. Question. There's a question um, in uh, relation to the library books. Uh, yeah. Whether you think the low percent of library books is uh, the result of intensive collection reading in academic libraries. This is a little bit like the chicken and the egg question. You know. Yeah, if, if the low use of um, is because of intensive weeding. I have really have no way of knowing, but judging from where people are getting readings instead um, from purchasing or publisher or pulling it off the shelf, it probably has more to do with the convenience the fact that their faculty, now this is just faculty, this is not students, but faculty um, rely more and more on e-journal reading at their desktop. They're not physically coming to the library more. They're not used to e-books yet for lots of reasons. So I think it just may be a convenience issue. They're not walking over to the library um, to look for them as much, and they're getting what they can pull off the shelf. That, that's a guess. Thank you. Um, the, the last point I wanted to make is um, we have seen um, for a number of years now a relationship between academic success and um, reading. And um, we measure success in two ways, um, one an award in the last two years and um, amount of publishing, total publishing, whether it's books, articles, other kinds of publishing. And if we look here at the blue bar is academics in the last two years who've published zero to two items, and the green bar is those who've published more than ten. We do see this continued relationship between reading of articles and publishing more. So those who read more, uh, publish more, um, not cause and effect. Well, it's, it's actually a dual causality because if you're going to be publishing more, you probably have to interact more. Um, don't see a lot of that relationship um, in terms of amount of publishing. We have also found in um, many of the universities that those who have won an award read more. Um, and that's certainly true across all the universities in the UK and Australia. It wasn't true in all of the universities in the US, um, but was, uh, was true in some of them. It would be something you want to look at individually to see the, the relationship with success. Um, that, that 
um, relationship with success has led us to look at personas. We've taken a subset of the data for those what we call a successful academic, those top-end academics, those kind that the provosts and chancellors want to make sure that they attract and keep at their universities. And we find that that subset of academics, uh, they read more, uh, they spend more time per reading, they use the library, they rely on the library, particularly for articles. They are more likely to get books from the library, um, but they also purchase. So their two main sources are library and purchases. And they do not use the library for their other publications, that is reports, government documents, and, um, conference papers. They don't use the, the library, they're using the Internet. Um, we also asked a lot of questions about social media. I haven't said that much about that today, and I don't have time today, uh, but do look for that in the reports. We find that on average, social media use um, is occasional rather than heavy. There is a relationship between age and social media use, um, and not surprisingly, um, but um, that is that those over 60 are uh, less likely to use uh, Twitter, for example, uh, than, than uh, younger, those actually those under 50, less likely. Um, but the successful academic is a user of multiple types of social media on an occasional, that is, less than monthly basis. So um, I need to uh, wrap up here. There's lots of questions that come up with this when you're talking about continually measuring value. We need to think about the role that libraries and e-books will have in terms of scholarly reading uh, uh, patterns. We also need to think very hard about open access. Does that change the value of the library? If you, if you are... Um, uh, lobbying for open access, then you need to, of course, measure. And if, you're, if open access is successful, we need to think about what the consequences are in terms of measuring value. So you need to think about what the library role is in providing access to the best materials. And then how does the, in a world where the library doesn't have a monopoly on that, how does the library look at their value? We also need to think about mobile devices and finding and reading. Um, we'll certainly see more and have already seen more in that. And then, as always, the, the age-old question of value always is, what can libraries do to continue to provide value, and what are the best features that they can incorporate into the systems and services for value? Thank you, Carol. We do have one question that I'd like to pose to, to you, but also uh, Rachel, um, who is following, uh, can also uh, answer it uh, in relation to the studies she's managed. Uh, it's a very specific question as to whether in, in uh, the study you examined whether faculty recommended a resource to students uh, and or their peers. Um, we, now, Rachel will have more to say on that, definitely, because that gets right into what she's doing. We asked um, what was the purpose of reading. So for teaching, um, we did find out what, what readings were for teaching, and we know some characteristics of that. We did not ask if that reading was then put on a reading list, for example. We didn't go that far. In, in the surveys of students, both graduates and undergraduates, we asked about was, was your reading, the last reading, was it for... Um, was it for an assigned reading, or was it for a class but not assigned? Was it for your uh, um, dissertation, et cetera? And for undergraduates, no surprise, the number one reason for reading is it was an assigned reading. Um, or, no, the number one combined, assigned reading or something uh, for class. So those two were very important. Undergraduates are very much driven by what the faculty member assigns to them or asks them to do for their class. But we didn't ask that of faculty. Thank you. Um, Rachel? Well, I think that I'll um, address this to an extent in my presentation. We didn't ask about casual recommendations, if that's what you're getting at. Um, but we did ask uh, instructors about the assignments, uh, reading assignments that they identified using library resources. And maybe I should just, Martha, I don't know if yes. there was anything you wanted to add, or maybe I should. Thank you. This is okay. good. I, I think you'll, you will say more about uh, some right. of that. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel Fleming May. I'm an assistant professor here at SIS at University of Tennessee want to welcome our current and future participants in this webcast. Uh, I'm going to talk today about two surveys that were, same survey essentially, but conducted both here at University of Tennessee 
and at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, to look into the value of the academic library's resources, including the facilities and services, to support the uh, act of teaching. Um, we wanted to look at teaching specifically because quite a bit of research has been done, of course, to look at faculty's usage of library resources and services to support their research. You can see, I hope that the slide has advanced to a screenshot from the Live Value Bibliographic Database, um, identifying the number of records attached to our research tag. That's about 36. Well, not about 36, it is 36. Um, on the other hand, if we look at teaching as a subject tag, we, that number decreases to 17. There are 17 records in the database connected to assessment of the library's value for teaching. And actually, the majority of these, the vast majority of these, are related to librarians as the teachers. That is, library instruction, the value of library instruction. We really wanted to look at the ways in which the library supports teaching. So how did we do that? We decided to conduct a survey um, at UTK and at UNCW, um, everybody that has instructional responsibility. That includes regular tenured or tenured track faculty, clinical faculty, part-time or contingent faculty, uh, graduate teaching assistants, and then also administrators like from the Dean of Students office who have instructional responsibilities as part of their position. We asked about the support provided by the libraries, including the materials that instructors use to support their teaching, what the materials they use to prepare to learn more about pedagogical techniques, perhaps, and then also the readings that they identify for their students. So it's always important when you're designing an assessment tool to identify the focus of your inquiry. There are so many things that we could ask about in this survey. We really wanted to make sure that we were hitting our institutional priorities. And in order to do that, we looked at a couple of different things, one of which was University of Tennessee's Vol Vision 2015, which is our strategic plan that identifies a number of goals for the university to reach over the next several years. Three of those are providing support to faculty and staff, um, graduate student education, and undergraduate student success. So we really wanted to make sure that we hit on all of those topics in our survey. We're also getting ready here at UTK to have our um, periodic review by our regional accreditor, that is SACS, here in the, the southern states. And um, I'm sure you all are aware that regional accreditors across the board over the past several years have become more and more concerned with measuring student success through outcomes. So we wanted to make sure that we caught that. Um, we also, in the state of Tennessee, and this is the case in many states across the country, have a legislature that is very concerned with the cost of education for our students. Um, we actually have, in the Code of Tennessee, legislation in place that requires faculty to take measures to reduce the amount of money spent on textbooks by students to the extent possible. And again, this is not unique to the state of Tennessee. It's very common. And in fact, we have federal legislation in the United States uh, through the Higher Education Opportunity Act that requests that faculty and publishers really take measures to reduce the cost of textbooks. So I'm going to get a little bit into the findings, specifically from the University of Tennessee now, and in a minute I'm going to compare those findings with some of the things we found out at UNCW. Um, so one of the things that we asked is uh, for those people who said that they actually used the library to um, in support of their teaching, we asked them in, in what ways they use the library for that. So, and if possible, if they could identify ways in which their teaching had improved as a result of using the library. Uh, we're very gratified to learn that a large majority of our respondents felt that the readings that they assign to their students are more up-to-date or varied as a result of using the library. Um, they read more or more widely to prepare for teaching. And it's also interesting throughout this to, to kind of note the ways in which our findings echoed uh, the findings that Carol um, just went over in, in terms of scholarly reading of faculty. Um, not a majority, but a large number of our respondents also felt that their assignments were more creative as a result of using library resources and services. Uh, we wanted to know how over the past three to five years our respondents approach to identifying readings for their classes, and this gets to maybe Kate's question a little bit, 
had, had changed. Um, unsurprisingly, they are more likely to search or browse subscription databases for readings. Um, I think it's interesting to note, though, that rather than conducting, you know, a known item search or a subject search in a database, they're even more likely to browse electronic journals. So 66% said that was a true or somewhat true statement. They're less likely to, again, not surprising, browse print journals. Um, only 7% are more likely to browse print journals than they were three to five years ago. I'm a little surprised even by that number, but, hey, you never know what you're going to find out when you conduct a survey like this. Um, we wanted to know, getting back to that textbook question, the textbook cost question, if their approach to assembling and uh, distributing or requiring readings to their students had changed in the past three to five years also. This gets to that, you know, the, the question of supporting the legislative um, priorities in the state and in the, at, at the federal level as well. Um, a third of our respondents said that they require their students to purchase fewer printed textbooks. So again, not a majority, but that's still a sizable number. Uh, we wanted to ask about those course packets, too, which some of you may remember. 31% um, said that they're less likely to assign their students to purchase course packets, but to be fair, 44% of our respondents said they never did that in the first place, which is probably good news. So those are just some of the highlights from UTK, and I want to, to go into a little bit of a comparison with our findings from UNCW. We wanted to, after conducting the survey here at UT, we wanted to see, you know, what would, what would our findings look like at a different type of university? So we were able to work with two alums of our program, actually, uh, Peter Fritzler and Ann Pemberton, who are at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, after a presentation that Carol gave. Um, for uh, the East Tennessee Library Association, they approached her about possibly getting involved with Live Value, and we were able to um, work with them to adapt and distribute our survey at the University of, at, of North Carolina Wilmington. Uh, UNCW is, of course, also a public institution like UT, but it is it's much smaller. Still a fairly large number of FTE enrollment, but less than half of ours. It is a master's level. A uh, larger program, Carnegie Designation University, where we're a research university with very high research activity. Uh, UNCW has five academic colleges, while we have 11. So getting into a little bit of comparison here, um, just in terms of services, we had asked about services uh, related to supporting teaching. If our respondents had asked a librarian to do any of the following, uh, to lead instruction, that is to create an instruction session for their students and conduct it, to identify teaching materials for the instructor, and to help with creating an assignment. I remember from my days as a public services librarian, that was one of the things I really um, tried hard to get my faculty to let me help them with, uh, because I often felt they needed help. But this was still, interestingly, 28% of respondents at UNCW said that they had actually worked with librarians to develop an assignment, while at U UTK, that number is only 11%. And this is pretty consistent throughout. We found a much higher level of involvement or interaction at UNCW in terms of uh, teaching concerns than at UTK. I suspect that that is because UNCW has a much stronger teaching focus than University of Tennessee Knoxville does. Um, so going on to look at some information about collections. A large number of, and this is just, um, just to clarify, we're talking here about, um, regardless of format, journals and books. Um, if they'd used journals, if they'd used books to support their teaching in any way, to identify readings, pedagogical support, whatever, um, large majority, interestingly, I think, had used uh, journals at both schools. Uh, fewer used books regularly. If they had used a librarian-created online guide, like a LibGuide or LibGuide, however you want to pronounce that, a smaller number, but still a sizable number had. And then, of course, um, NA, I've used none of these aspects of the collection. We wanted to look also at the format. Um, so we did ask the second set of bars over if they had used print sources, books or journals, or if they used electronic sources. And unsurprisingly, at both institutions, a larger number were using electronic. I do want to note here that um, I might have expected, just because the University of Tennessee's collection is so much larger than that of UNCW, that we would have a larger number of University of Tennessee instructors using the library's collection in support of their teaching. That was not the case. In every area that we um, asked about, UNCW um, faculty and instructors 
said that they used their collection more than our, their UT counterparts did. A couple of questions, Rachel. Sure. Um, in relation to the instructors, there is a question whether they use an LMS, and if not, were there noticeable differences for those who do use a learning management system? Um, we didn't actually ask about that. We asked them if they made readings available through um, Blackboard, is, is the LMS that we use here at UT, and several of them um, did say that they, they make readings available that way, but I haven't actually looked at that subset of respondents as, you know, looked at their other responses, but that would be a very interesting thing to look at. I think at this point um, it's very difficult to be an instructor and not utilize an LMS, um, but that would be a very interesting thing to look at, I mean, especially at UT. It's difficult to do that, um, but at UNCW that may not be the case, so thank you for that question slash suggestion. I'm going to go back and look at that. That's a very good question. And to one more in relation to uh, the use of librarians uh, to to support, um, it, it says, is UTK uh, significantly lower because more courses are taught by TAs rather than faculty? Um, I, I can't answer that definitively, um, but my instinct is that, no, that's not the case. Um, just from working with librarians here at, at Hodges Library as much as I have, on other aspects of live value, um, including some assessment related to library instruction, um, TAs actually use instruction, it seems, much more heavily than regular faculty. So um, again, I can't empirically answer that question, but I suspect that that's, that, that is not the, the reason. Thank you. Okay, so we asked about savings all kinds of savings, and I'm going to get a little bit into money and time savings in a minute. Um, but it was very interesting to note that you know, these were the two largest areas of savings identified by our respondents at both institutions were time. They don't have to drive to the library or walk to the library or find their book on the shelf, whatever, um, because they're using electronic resources largely. But also just the savings in terms of paper. Um, our respondents were very concerned in some cases with the environmental uh, repercussions of, of using so much paper, and we're very appreciative of being able to move to that electronic format. I thought that this, this first quote, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. Um, you can go back and read it at your leisure if you'd like, but um, really kind of sums up all of the, the sort of successes that we identified. Um, this respondent seemed to really get it that you know, they're saving quite a bit of money in terms of making copies and just the many hours that they're saving in identifying and creating supplemental readings for their students. That, you know, time is money and that it's important to have to acknowledge that savings. Um, our second comment here is that the importance of electronic journals, and this is something that came up again and again. Um, the appreciation of our instructors at both institutions for the availability of electronic format materials. Um, and this person said that you know, it's invaluable to working with graduate students. Um, this point, and, and this really resonates with me as an instructor, I uh, frequently don't assign uh, textbooks in my classes because I can identify more current and relevant material for my students through our electronic resources subscriptions. Um, and that's kind of echoed here by this in this first statement that this instructor is really talking about savings of their own money in, in purchasing textbooks to review for assignment, but um, they're making that point that they don't have to spend as much money on textbooks. Um, also the point about clutter, not having so much paper around. Spaces at a premium at many academic institutions, I would say probably most. So that is a very real consideration as well. And then again, the, this last comment I, I thought was great, that the library is a resource that, and without it there would be chaos in teaching at this university. So I want to point out too that any time you conduct an assessment, and you all know this, it's, it's an opportunity for public relations. I mean, just in asking your constituents their opinion or to make some kind of a contribution or suggestions, you're communicating that you're interested in, in what they have to say, and that is public relations. 
Um, but it also gives you an opportunity to perhaps design future public relations efforts because you find out, you know, what's working, what's not, but then also what your respondents just aren't aware of. Um, so I've identified some of these findings as not, you know, problems or areas of improvement, but opportunities. Um, the first comment I thought was very interesting, and this is something that you might get in an anonymous survey like this, but a faculty member might be less likely to either send an email to their liaison or approach the desk with this question that this instructor said, I need help with uh, proper citations, and especially for images. And that's you know, a very, very good question. It might be something for, this was at UNCW, for them to design a tutorial or some other sort of instructional opportunity around. Um, the next person said that the level of difficulty of the materials at the library is too advanced for their students. Uh, I'm not sure how to explore this or what might be the outcome of this, but it would definitely, I would think, be worth investigating further. And then I wanted to include this old chestnut, which comes up again and again in research. Faculty members, many faculty members who work with graduate students have this idea that if their graduate students don't already know how to use the library, they're lost, they might as well give it up. And those of you who have worked with graduate students know that many of them could use a little guidance. So this, to me, just kind of highlights the importance of perhaps circumventing some faculty, not always using them as a gateway to graduate students, but approaching graduate students directly. Um, now, in terms of money and time savings, and we're speaking of time, we're just about out of time, so I'm, I'm not going to go over these in extreme detail. Um, I just want to point out that many of our respondents at both schools said that they saved either very little or um, no time or money at all as a report of using, as a, I'm sorry, as a result of using the library to support their teaching. Now, this directly contradicts many of the open-ended comments that we got, and it also contradicts, I just listening to Carol give her presentation, back to slide 25, um, the decrease in personal subscriptions that faculty are having to invest in to um, academic journals. That's a very real monetary savings. So again, I think this is an opportunity for perhaps some branding, um, a gentle reminder on the part of libraries that um, perhaps they are assisting faculty in these ways, all instructors in these ways. Um, and getting to the point that I made about public relations and increasing awareness, um, a sizable number of our respondents who said that they were non-users of the library resources, facilities, services to support their teaching said that they were simply unaware that the library offered those types of uh, services, resources, or collections. So it's important to note that. Um, and it also goes to this point that um, we did ask, taking advantage of, of having this audience, we did ask our respondents if they would be interested in sending their email address and getting more, being contacted by a liaison librarian, learning more about what the library had to offer. And not a majority, but seven, about 75 respondents at each institution said that they would be. That's a pretty sizable number, I think. It's, it's worth noting. Um, just going back to that, that unawareness, um, this first comment, the, this um, respondent said, I didn't realize the extent of services available through the library and that they were maybe a little bit embarrassed about not using the library. And then, you know, maybe the second person was aware of what was offered, but just never really thought about it, especially with distance education. So again, just another kind of reminder about um, making sure that that outreach is happening and, and users are actually aware of what you have to offer. Thank so, you. Okay. Sorry, caveats. Uh, I, I know we're just about out of time. That's okay. Um, we if you can want take to, if a little couple more minutes. Okay. If you want to do a survey like this, um, just a couple of pointers, learning from our experience or mistakes, that it's really important to pretest, to pilot your survey with a small number of people because once you've distributed that link to your survey, you can't undistribute it. It's out there. Um, so you want to make sure that everything is really working properly within the software and you're really asking what you want to ask in the most effective way. Um, because a large number of your respondents are going to be researchers who conduct surveys themselves, they're going to have an opinion, some of them, and they may want to share that opinion with you. So just something to be prepared for, that you may get some comments about the structure of your instrument itself. And some of those can be very, very helpful, but just don't get your feelings hurt. Um, it's really important to have a distribution strategy for your survey. I mentioned um, at the beginning of my presentation that we were not able to work with our Office of um, 
instructional technology um, to, or uh, sorry, information technology to distribute this directly to everyone with instructional responsibilities. We had to cobble together kind of a, a collection of listservs, and um, it wasn't the most effective way to distribute it, but it's what we had available. And sometimes you do have to kind of um, make a patchwork um, in order to get your, your survey invitation out there. Um, it's important as you commence work on a project like this to secure support both at your library's administrative level, your university's administrative level, um, maybe with your faculty liaisons in the departments, um, with your office of instructional, or I'm sorry, information technology, just to make sure that this is as effective as it possibly can be. So that's all that I had to say. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. We do have a fun poll, and uh, Amy will uh, help me push that out. Uh, we'll uh, have you guess how much money your instructors save? Amy? Um, Rachel, shared data on um, what faculty members' perceptions were, the amount of money that they saved. Um, and uh, so we're asking you to estimate the average amount that your library saves each, each instructional faculty member per uh, semester. That's a guess. <laughs> but, um, it will be interesting if, um, you know, you take, uh, you take this, we take this poll and then you go back and do the survey uh, trying to figure out whether your guess was close to reality. So the results? Uh, previewing the results, 11% um, believe $50, um, or between 50 and 100, uh, 23% $100, 11% $200, 23% $500 and 29% uh, $1,000 or more. Ooh, wow. So we and no one that. believes that um, the library doesn't save faculty members any money yet. Oh, of course. We're all converters. <laughs> so thank you very much for attending this webcast. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, the uh, next webcast is on August 15th, and it's going to focus on digitized special collections. We have a question about the tools and the surveys. Some of them are already available on the Believe Value website, but we are also uh, are going to have a toolkit available uh, that uh, uh, ARL will provide to the community after the uh, conclusion of the project. Uh, so. Uh, we'll make announcements for the toolkit um, as um, it's available by the end of the year before, before most likely. We thank you. Could, could I add one thing to that, Martha? I'm yes. sorry, this is Rachel. Yes. Um, if you would be interested, I should have said this early, earlier, if in looking at the survey instrument, the instructor survey instrument, or possibly adapting it for your institution, if you want to get in touch with me, my email address is rf-m at utk.edu, and I would be happy to um, work with you on that. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, everybody, for attending this webcast. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. That does conclude today's webcast. We thank you for your participation. We now disconnect your lines, and have a great day.